In this paper, uh, we discuss debt crisis. We are going to review the experiences of three different unions, Europe, the United States, and Canada. You know, we all know about this ongoing phenomenal debt crisis in Europe. What's uh, less known is that many of the US states have experienced a uh, debt crisis comparable to some of the countries in Europe. During these debt crises, the spreads on public borrowing rose dramatically. There were differences in uh, the crisis in uh, Europe and in the US states. For example, the underlying levels of debt at which these crises occur were very high in Europe and are very low uh, in US states. In Europe, there were also spillovers to private borrowers, whereas in the US, there were not. We're going to argue in this paper that the European countries faced an external debt crisis. The US uh, states faced a public debt crisis. I also though, had Canada on the title. Canada has been a, a pr pretty much a poster child. The Canadian provinces have not experienced any debt crisis. So what we're going to do in this paper is we're going to argue that the different experiences from these three unions result from the interplay of two forces. One is differences in the risk of government interference with uh, private debt contracts. And we define these as, as I said, as the ability of the government to interfere with private external debt repayment. The second force is differences in fiscal flexibility which is defined as the ability to vary revenue and spending appropriately. And we're going to demonstrate that these two forces can lead to the different experiences observed in these unions. We're going to have these three applications from a single unified theory. I will show you that when a government can interfere with private debt contracts but has fiscal flexibility, then in that environment, public debt crises and private external debt crises will occur together. And we see these as the appropriate case uh, for the European countries. When the government cannot interfere with private debt repayment and is, has limitations on the uh, flexibility of their fiscal instruments, then in that environment, only public debt crises will occur and that is the relevant case for the U.S. states. Last, when the government cannot interfere with private debt repayment and is fec uh, fiscally flexible, then in that environment, no debt crisis will occur. Let me now show you some data. So this is the very popular data on uh, uh, spreads on government debt in Europe. For the case of uh, Italy and Spain, the spreads on government debt rose and reached levels of about 500 basis points. This is the similar plot for spreads uh, for uh, the states of California, Illinois, New York, and Michigan. And you see that in 2009, the spreads uh, for some of these states rose significantly reaching levels comparable to the, those observed in Italy and Spain. Just across the border for the Canadian provinces, Ontario, Quebec, British Columbia, the spreads that they were facing on the government debt were pretty stable. Now, the underlying levels of debt of these three unions are different. For example, the levels of debt for the uh, uh, Canadian provinces here in green were pretty large, actually comparable to some of the European uh, countries. The plot, the shaded uh, um, regions of the plot include unfunded liabilities. So the uh, uh, Canadian provinces with substantial levels of debt did not have that crisis. The debt crisis in the, in the European countries happened with levels of GDP, uh, debt to GDP of you know, around over 100%. And the US states, in contrast, had this debt crisis with very low levels of debt. 
on average, net debt to, GD to state GDP is uh, around 5%. In uh, Europe, as I argue, this public debt crisis had spillovers to the private sector. What I am showing in this plot is cumulative net capital inflows from 2001 uh, to 2012, and you see that these net capital inflows reach to uh, levels of about 50% uh, of GDP. What you can also see from this plot is the decomposition of total net uh, capital inflows between uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, private inflows and uh, inflows coming from uh, official sources. And you see that in the debt crisis, there was a sudden stop, a reversal on these private inflows, where uh, the, 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 um, and the, the total inflows didn't really drop that much, mainly due to uh, ECB transfers and other transfers, uh, other official uh, programs. A second way to see these spillovers to the private sector in Europe is to look at the co-movement of spreads uh, for uh, corporations, non-financial corporations. In this graph, uh, this is the, uh, the red line. And the, uh, uh, the spreads on sovereigns. In this graph, th that's the green line. And you can see that also for the case of Spain, but this holds also for other countries in Europe, you know, there's a strong co-movement uh, of corporate spreads and sovereign spreads. We, in the US, we did not really see these spillovers to the private sector. In fact, as, a, as an anecdote, uh, in July 2009, when the California government was had, issuing this debt at very you know, high spreads, in fact, they issued some IOUs to finance uh, some short-term financing. LA County was able to borrow at really low rates. So having looked at this evidence, what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you a model that is going to integrate the experiences from these three uh, unions. The model is a simple model. It has, it's a small open economy model with two periods and deterministic output. Output in period one is less than output in period two, which creates the bar, a borrowing motif. Households have preferences over private consumption and public expenditures. In the model, private agents, uh, households, and uh, domestic intermediaries have commitment to repay their debts, while the government lacks commitment to repay its domestic or its external debt. We're, we're going to consider environments, as I've been mentioning, where, the where there's differences in the risk of government interference, meaning when there is risk of interference, the government can induce a default on private external debt, and also environments with varying flex of fiscal flexibility. When the government is fiscally flexible, it's going to be able to set taxes freely. Defaulting on domestic external uh, debt or interfering with the payment of private debt is going to induce a resource cost. So in this model, we have um, different level, different debts. For example, we have uh, the uh, B, the public domestic debt, the DG, which is the public external debt, and the DP, which is uh, private external debt. There's going to be resource cost uh, from default or interfering, one for each one, denoted by delta. The government is uh, uh, benevolent, and the price of debt is going to compensate ex ante, so in this, in this case in period one, is going to compensate <coughs> creditors for default and interference. So an important parameter in our model that is going to determine this degree of interference is this delta P. How do we think about it? We think about this, this parameter as reflecting the institutional arrangements in these different regions. In the US and in Canada, the constitutions provide strong creditor protection for, for private creditors. For example, in the US, uh, the contract clause limits states from issuing paper money, changing the legal tender, and uh, imposing moratoria on repayments. We view this institutional environment as uh, one where there's large interference cost, a large delta P. 
There are some uh, treaties for Europe too, for example, this treaty on the functioning of the European Union that limits the euro to be the legal tender. But of course, there's the risk of euro exit, which we are actually all um, witnessing right now with Greece. And also, this treaty allows for capital controls and suspension of property rights in case of emergency, as they actually did in the case of Cyprus. We see this uh, institutional environment as one where there's a small interference cost. Okay, so let's go back to the model. So in this, this is a very simple model. If uh, the unconstrained optimal in this model will require that private consumption is equal to public expenditure, which equals to one-fourth of the aggregate you know, income. Of course, in our model, the, the government lacks commitment to repay debt, and there are going to be some debt constraints arising from that lack of commitment. That can be binding. We're going to need to define a binding external constraint as the case where the marginal utility of private consumption is larger than the marginal utility in period one than that of period two, and a binding public constraint if the marginal utility of public expenditures in period one is larger than that in period two. Let's consider the case of uh, interference and fiscal flexibility, and we see this as the appropriate case for the European countries. Just to give you a flavor of what the problem looks like, here is uh, sort of the problem in period two for the government. The government is going to choose taxes, tau two, and default and interference with these indicator functions that are equal to one if it, there's repayment to maximize the utility of the representative household. The first result that we have is that there will not be a domestic default here. The reason is because the government might default on domestic debt to raise revenue, but that is going to lower private consumption, okay? But in addition, it's gonna have this, uh, this extra resource cost. So it's best for the government to, with flexible taxes, to simply raise taxes, uh, because that's gonna have the same distributional effects among private and public agents, and you know, it can save on the resource cost. Now, in terms of uh, default, external default and interference, it might occur in this uh, model. And uh, the rules for default and interference is going to be natural. The, the government is going to choose to default or interfere if the level of debt that uh, it has to pay is greater than the cost. So these uh, rules for defaulting and interfering are going to uh, imply that they're in period one, that's going to limit the amount of resources that, they, that the government can borrow. Okay? Um, in addition, the government is going to choose taxes and is going to choose taxes to, uh, to set private consumption equal to public consumption. Okay? So in this environment, because of the possibility of uh, binding debt constraints, there, there might be a binding debt constraint, but the external and the public constraint is always going to bind together. So this environment, if there's a crisis here, uh, or if there's, a, if there's a binding constraint, is going to occur for both uh, uh, for the public and for the external constraint. Now let's move to the other case. Okay, let's consider now the case of uh, no interference. Suppose that this uh, interference cost is very large, okay, and fiscal flexibility. In this case, when uh, the cost of interference is very large, there's basically no debt constraints on private borrowing. Okay? And households uh, or consu private consumption is going to be equalized across time. Consumption in period two is going to be equal to consumption in period uh, one. Now, with fiscal flexibility, the government, again, can use taxes freely. And what the government actually can do is borrow from the private households such that you know, it equalizes private expenditure over time and, that, and, and make that equal to private uh, consumption. Okay? And so in this case, the government you know, is, always lacks commitment. So you know, it might face these uh, constraints on external borrowing, but the public debt constraint is irrelevant. So in the case of no interference and fiscal flexibility, we get that you know, no, not constraints are going to bind. This is what we think about uh, for the case of Canada. 
Last, let's consider the case of the US states. So here is the, uh, this here is the case where the government does not interfere with private contracts, but has uh, fiscal inflexibility. Okay. So as in the previous case, the, um, the private consumption is going to be, um, you know, there's no uh, constraints on private borrowing, and so consumption is equalized over time, private consumption. But now, with fiscal inflexibility, in particular, suppose that the tax in period two is fixed and it's low, then the private uh, consumption is going to be greater than public consumption. Okay. And so there might be a reason for the government here to default on both external and domestic debt, because this would be the only way to raise revenue. <coughs> the rules for defaulting on these two types of debt are similar to the previous case. So, you know, default is, is going to happen when the debt is greater than the cost, but now, you know, it's going to be weighted by the, the particular agent that uh, pays or suffers the cost. These, uh, these rules on domestic and external uh, default are going to imply that the government faces this, uh, potentially can face these binding debt constraints. And so in this environment, we get that only the public constraint is going to bind. These are our main theoretical results. The paper uh, contains a few other theoretical results and also other parts of the paper. For example, the paper documents the, um, the, uh, 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 the sovereign credit ceiling okay? and how that has been a, a, um, the, the credit agencies have brought it back for the European countries uh, and uh, the, these rating agencies have used or used the risk of government interference as a main factor that, uh, for uh, limiting the rating of private corporations in European countries. We also uh, review how, uh, for the U.S. states, these credit agencies actually give them lower ratings specifically because of their uh, lack of fiscal flexibility and contrast them with the flexibility in Canadian provinces. Finally, we have uh, sort of historical accounts on uh, the constraints on inter or interference. For example, we document that before the Constitution and the Contract Clause was established, there were many cases where states actually interfere with private repayments of debt. Okay? And, but why, and after the contract clause was ratified with the US Constitution, you know, this uh, contract clause was used to um, you know, protect creditors, uh, pr uh, pr the pr protect creditors okay, through various court rulings. So let me conclude. So in conclusion, we've provided an integrated analysis uh, of default risk on external and public debt. We think that our work has some lessons for addressing the debt crisis in the Eurozone. For example, we think that institutions that mitigate the risk of government interference might prove useful in terms of limiting a debt crisis to stay, stay in the public sector. And integrated banking might actually be a good way to do it. Second, we also think that uh, the uh, restrictions on fiscal flexibility that have been talked about for Europe, one consideration is that that is actually going to reduce the debt sustainability of many, uh, you know, might reduce the debt sustainability of many of the European countries. <laughs>